I am so glad you're here, and I am excited to uh, get to walk into a passage that, a story that everybody knows, but I found that most people don't know. And it's the story in Matthew chapter 2 of the coming of the Magi, the, the wise men. Uh, how many of you have heard this story? How many of you every Christmas sing about this story? You know, we three kings of Orient Art, you know, you know, bearing gifts, we've traveled so far, and all, all those things. But, um, but what I want to show you is that Matthew has a very, very specific purpose for telling you this story. And his purpose has to do with, uh, we're in a series, and the, and the larger theme of our series, and even this year as a church, is seek first his kingdom. And his righteousness. But in these early chapters of Matthew, uh, he, the writer is establishing that this is the one and only true king that God had promised from, you know, from the beginning that one would come and this was the Messiah. And the Messiah was more than just a political ruler who was going to give us temporal peace and freedom from our oppressors. This was the one who was going to save us from our sin. Now, in order to really get your attention, I need you to put your imagination cap on, and I need you to think if we were reading, you know, we would be in some kind of home, and the, the Gospel of Matthew, the letter, would be opened, and, uh, and we would read in verse 1 of chapter 2, we would read this. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king. Now stop. Now I want you to turn to the person next to you and just give them, right. Just say it. Did you sense the sarcasm? Right. You could have eye rolled it. Right. Because we would have immediately eye rolled at this moment. When we heard in the days of Herod, air quotes, the king. Why? Because of all the things Herod was, he was not the legitimate king. But I'll tell you, he was one of the most fascinating people that you can study. Uh, I had the chance to go to Israel. You cannot walk through the land of Israel without feeling the impact of Herod the Great. If you go to where the, the temple was and look at the Temple Mount, you're looking at the ruins of the reconstructed temple that Herod built. If you go down to the ocean, you'll see Caesarea Philippi, one of the most beautiful seaports you're ever going to see. Herod built that. Herod gave infrastructure to the entire city of Jerusalem. He built so many things. He was an architect. He was an orator. He was a philosopher. He was a phenomenal guy. He was also one of the most cunning, vicious politicians you have ever met. If he lived in this day and age, in this season, we would all be talking about Herod, his opinion, and he had been incredible in that he was so conniving that he had managed to get himself to Rome, and while at Rome, he convinced Caesar Augustus, the then ruler of the known world, that he was essential to Judea, and he had himself appointed by Caesar as Herod, king of the Jews. Now, for all of this guy's... Um, amazing capacity he was also a rather insecure fellow he was very threatened why because Herod king of the Jews was not a Jew he was an Edomite he was also someone who had gotten to the place he was by being more vicious and ruthless than anybody around him understand this is a 70 year old guy this is a guy who has been clinging and holding on to power in the most politically powder keg slice of country in the world. Do you guys know that all roads lead to Judea, to Israel? This is where all of the battles of who's going to be who and who's going to rule what all seem to take place in this little nowhere country with a little nowhere people called Jews. Sounds like today, doesn't it? Why? 
Whose land is it? It's God's. And has a special purpose. But I'm telling you, this is where this guy is. And he is literally so fragile. I mean, here he's been ruling for 30 plus years in Jerusalem. But this guy is so fragile, he's threatened by everything. His brother-in-law was in the priesthood and just said a few things wrong about him. Herod organized a little swimming party. They all went down to the ocean. And guess what he did? He had some friends of his wade out into the water with his brother-in-law. Then when no one's looking, they just held him underwater. Drowned him. And Herod wept at his funeral, having planned the whole thing. He killed both of his nephews because they might be those who could legitimately take his throne. Then he killed their mother because he didn't like her. Five days before he died, he put his own son to death because he didn't want his son to take his legacy. On the day he died, he had put plans in place so that throughout all of the major political households of the land of Judea, at least one member of their household would be executed, so at least on that day, the day of his death, there would be weeping in the land of Judea. This guy, Herod the king, stands in absolute contrast with the king of kings who has been born. And contrary to what you think, when you read through this, we always talk about the Magi, and we always talk about baby Jesus, but guess who the whole passage, Matthew chapter 2, revolves around? Herod. God is really making a point, crew, and the point is that this whole thing, this whole chapter, revolves around what true royalty is. How do you respond to a real king? What do you do with royalty? And in the points that I've made, you'll see that issue of royalty in the recognition of Jesus Christ, in the opposition of Jesus Christ, in the actual worship of Jesus Christ, in the protection, the divine protection of Jesus in this moment, and then finally, even in the attempted destruction of Jesus Christ, you see, and Matthew is trying to tell you, this is the king, and this is how you respond to him. So, I'm just telling you, there's a little more to the story, amen? So let's look at this. I want you to open your Bibles up, Matthew chapter 2, if you're not there. And I want to begin with this idea of royal recognition. I want you to do something first for me. It's early. I just want you to turn to the person next to you. I know it sounds like we're in school. And give them an enthusiastic, hello! Just just shout at them right now. I know it's going to annoy you. (laughs) I don't often do that, but I'm like, I needed it. It's not for you. I was like, all right, let's do this. All right, royal recognition. And this is where I think the story differs from what you've heard or what you've seen. When you think of the story of the Magi, how many were there? Popular opinion, what? Three. Why do we do that? Why do we say there were three of them? Three gifts. gifts. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Do you know that that has been so embellished over time? Now there are only three of them, and, and the gifts... Uh, are reflective. There's a whole tradition that says these are the uh, original sons of Noah. They're descendants of Ham, Shem, and Japheth. We've given them names. Balthazar, Melchor, you know, these guys. And it's like all this stuff, and I'm just here to tell you, none of it's true. Sorry. All your Christmas cards? Waste of time. (laughs) You know? The three kids who get paraded through the church programs? A lie. Don't tell them. No, why do I say that to you? Because these were not kings. Listen to me. These were king makers. These were not kings. These were king makers. Makers. Did you know that the origin of the Magi, you can trace it all the way back to the 7th century B.C., to the time of Abraham, when God called Abraham out of Ur of the Chaldees. These men, and when you think of them, I want you to think of them this way. 
These were a political, priestly class of individuals. They were the most powerful and most authoritative class of individuals in any kingdom anywhere in Persia. These were who's who of political power and priestly authority. Why? Because they were called wise men, because their whole venue of study was astrology, and, and uh, you know, they did astrology, they did uh, study of the stars, astronomy, uh, and, and they, were, they were those who studied the stars. So they were mathematicians, they were philosophers, and their whole bent was to go out before whoever was a ruler and to be able to give them the portents and the readings of what's going to happen. So they arose to great power. How many of you know we just finished a study of the book of Daniel? How many of you know that that study is chock full of these guys? The wise men, the magicians they call them. Literally, do you remember when uh, Daniel, he interprets the king of Nebuchadnezzar and he becomes the chief what? The chief wise man. He ascended to the highest position of this rank. By the time you get to Babylon, there is no one more powerful than this sect of people. Anywhere. And I want to tell you something even more interesting that really flavors this story. Did you know that in Persia, you could not be crowned king until you had mastered the mathematical, the astrological, and the philosophical teachings of the wise men. And then, if you mastered them, then and only then could you be crowned king by the wise men. And if you were not crowned king by the wise men, you weren't a king in Persia. Are you enjoying this? Now let's go a little deeper. 20 years before this moment, Herod the king had booted the Parthians, the Persians, out of Judea. On this day, the wise men return. The king makers return. And at that time in history, Persia was one of the only competing empires with Rome. And guess what? Persia wasn't happy with its present king. They felt he was weak, and they didn't feel like he was a a person of power. And so Herod finds out that here come the Persian kingmakers strolling into Judea, the most politically eruptive place on the planet that has a population of Jews who don't like Rome all that well and would love for a Messiah king to rise up and could this be Persia's opportunity to throw off the ranks of Rome and then they hear where is he who has been born king of the Jews for we have come to worship him Now, how many of you would say this was a little bit more exciting moment than we originally think? This is crazy. Who were these magi? They were kingmakers. Literally, they were those who only show up to pronounce royalty on a mission like this. I think it would also be helpful... uh, for you to understand why this caused so much fear. We always think of like, you know, I don't know why we think of it. I mean, it's all been in our cartoons, you know, three guys on camels, and there's always a chubby one and a skinny one and a medium one. Have you seen that? You know, the boom, 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 boom. it's like, you know, it's Aladdin. Boom, 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 boom. And here they come. And what you've got to understand is that when these guys showed up, now I want you to Imagine a a, a cohort of 200 Persian warriors. If you know anything about the city of Jerusalem, it's not huge. I mean, you're talking armed escort. This is the royalty of Persia as far as its power is showing up in Judea, and they come marching in, and there are tents, and there are... Uh, You know, I don't know how much, but this is not some group of a few people came waltzing into Jerusalem. I mean, this could look like an attack, let alone an announcement. 
And here they come. And so they are afraid. They are afraid. Literally, uh, I always do this. I kind of get my notes out of order. But when you, when you think about why they showed up, you, know, you see kind of the, the origin of those magi. Now, now think about what they were there to do. Look at verse 2. The objective. Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star in the east, and we have come to worship him. This is where, historically, you got to say, how did this happen? Um, first of all, we don't know how much time has gone on. We know that uh, they talk about Jesus with a different term than infant. He is now a child. So any time between like six months to two years, they took a journey, the Magi did, to get to Jerusalem. We don't know the exact dates, but we know that that much is true. And why did they come? Well, again, at one point, Daniel had been the chief of the Magi. And the Magi existed in almost every empire, and they just switched jobs. They're the only political power that got... You want to know why they were so powerful? Because they didn't end when a new king came. They just shifted. You went from Nebuchadnezzar to Babylon to Darius the Mede. And and there you go. Boom. The Magi just shift. But all along the way, what we find out about these guys is that they were monotheistic. Do you guys know what that means? It means they believed in one God. And they believed that this one God was in charge of all creation. And the way they saw how He led was to study the stars. And sometime in their history, most probably because of Daniel, they had begun to put things together. And Daniel had taught them of the prophecies of God and that God had said that there was going to, a time was going to come when a king would come forth and it would be God's king and he would be more than a king. More than the king of the Jews. And so they saw a star in the east. Actually, they said they saw a star, and a better translation is in the place of its rising. They saw a star. Um, And because of what they saw, now this is what you need to understand. They believed. Now I'm going to use that word strongly. They believed there was a God, and He revealed Himself. And so if all of your relationship with God takes place with the stars and you're monotheistic, and you see an anomaly, I mean, you guys need to know, they they would take constellations, they would take things, and they're trying to figure things out, but they were always dealing with certainties and subtle shifts, and then all of a sudden, something happens that just breaks every norm you've ever known. And because of it, they put two and two together, and they remembered. They remembered what it said in number 24-7, and they probably remembered it in their studies, that one would come and a star will come forth from Jacob. And because of that, they go on this journey, and it takes them all the way here. Um, Now, I want to just sort of insert this, just for fun. What do you guys think the star was? That's close. What? Anybody? How many of you have believed your whole life it was a star? I'm, I'm going to blow up your head. It wasn't a star. There's no way it was a star. It doesn't behave like any star there is. And literally, when you read the story and what the star does, if it was a star... I'm sure God could keep it from cooking the planet, but we would all not be here. Because literally, this star appears suddenly, and then it's gone, and when it appears again, it's directly in front of them, and it literally leads them on a four-mile journey to Bethlehem and parks itself over a house. Not any star I know. We wouldn't call this a shooting star or it's in slow-mo. What is it? I just want to give you this insight. To what I, I'm going to tell you what I believe the best explanation from Scripture is. I believe that the best biblical evidence is that the star is the Shekinah glory of God. 
You guys remember what happened on the night that Jesus Christ was born? There were some shepherds out in the field watching over their flocks by night. And suddenly, the glory of God split the sky. It says all of heaven showed up to shout, glory to God in the highest, and on earth goodwill and peace towards men with whom he is well pleased. In that moment of time, Literally, we are talking about the reflected glory of God being seen in such a powerful way that it literally shocked all of these guys. And here's what I want to remind you of. How many of you believed, or I've always thought, that they followed the star to where Jesus was from the start of the journey? They never did. Look at the text. They saw something. They saw a light that they could not explain, and so they termed it a star. But you guys need to know that the entire journey, imagine a year you have been traveling with only the hope of what you saw one time. What did you see? I believe they saw the glory of God. Why? Because God's glory is always pictured as light, is it not? How many of you have heard this? He dwells in inapproachable light. And we talk in Scripture about the glory of God being seen. Uh, Jesus is referred to as the bright and morning star, is He not? I mean, think about this. Moses encountered the glory of God. You remember he goes up on a Mount Sinai and he receives the tablets. Do you remember what was wrong with his face when he came down? He's literally shining so much they like dump a tent over his head and they're like, cover that, we're all tanning. The the glory is so powerful, we can't hardly take it. And and literally, I love this most of all, Matthew 17, we'll see this in our study someday, when Peter, James, and John go up on the mountain with Jesus at the moment of transfiguration, and Jesus, the veil about Him is pulled back. Do you remember what they said of Him? His face shone like the sun. So I believe that the best explanation for what this star was was the glory of God that appeared. The Shekinah glory of God that shines out from Jesus Christ in His presence. Look, it's veiled. But these guys saw it, and they followed it. They followed it. And I love what they were purposeful to do. Did you notice that? We have come to what? To worship Him. How many of you have heard that phrase, wise men still seek Him? We get it on pillows, you know, we get it on pictures, and it's somewhere, I think that's a wallpaper at Hobby Lobby, you know? Wise men still seek it. I just think they need to amend it. Wise men seek Him to worship Him. There are so many things you can worship in this life that are worthless, but true wisdom is to be led by the one and only source of glory to the Prince of Glory. Amen? And that's what these guys did. This whole journey is that they believe from what they had been taught from Daniel of old that a king has been born. It's the only explanation they can give for what they saw for whatever amount of time. And then they made the journey all the way there to do what? If he is who God said, who we have believed he is, then there is only one thing we're here to do today, and that's to worship him. You know, a lot of people come towards Jesus with another agenda, don't they? Not these guys. Not these guys. They came to worship him. So you see this royal recognition. The magi, the kingmakers, have come to worship the king. Next point. And I'm going to give you this freebie. We're not finishing the sermon today. Some of you are like, you're all, I can see you're, you're calculating. You're like, he took two hours to get through. We're not. So just breathe and enjoy. We're in it. Now look at some royal opposition. Verse 3 ends this way. It says, When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. 
I think the arrival of this group of men and their whole cohort went off like a political bomb for him. I mean, it was the sum of all fears. And literally, their arrival caused everyone. That word fear, if you look at it, uh, uh, it, it caused them to be troubled. It's the same word that's used of the disciples in the boat in the middle of the storm where Jesus was asleep. They are shaking. Like it's that kind of fear. It just gripped his heart. And he is afraid. And all Jerusalem with you. Why is he afraid? Because Herod is caught in this political power keg. I kind of gave insight into it. These are the kingmakers. He's an illegitimate king who has held on to his power for 30 years. But these guys represent what... You guys need to know. How many of you know... When he says, in just in a verse, he's going to say, hey, tell me where the, 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 the Christ is going to be born, where the anointed one's going to be born. And I, made the, I was thinking, like, how does he know it's the Christ? How many of you know that Herod's already dead with a few would-be messiahs? He's already dealt with them. It's been 30 years in the land of Israel. How many of you know they grow a lot of messiahs there? Guys raising up. Guess what? All of those previous attempts did not show up with the kingmakers did not show up with a royal entourage of people in authority to pronounce this is the king. And so he realizes that he could literally be deposed by an infant. At the end of all his political journey, the end was the Messiah came and I was no more. And so he is fearful. He is scared of what might happen. And so we'll see. He'll pull out all the stops trying to you know, keep that from happening. He's afraid of losing power, you know. It's the sum of all fears for him. But I love how it says, and all Jerusalem with them. Now, to get an idea, have you ever seen in a movie where, like, there's this slightly unbalanced ruler, but everybody in the courtroom's acting like he's fine or that she's fine, you know? It's almost like Alice in Wonderland. Off with his head, you know? You get the mad lady you know i don't know i don't know i can't remember her name queen of hearts something like that but literally it's like that like this guy is not opposed to killing opposition and to doing whatever it takes to stay in power now imagine it's almost like a carnival comes to town there are tents there are pomps there are circumstances there are rulers you can imagine everybody running in to to see who are these guys and then one of them stands up and they're all crowding in and says Tell us where the king of the Jews has been born. And they're all running up and they're like, shh. Don't say that. Don't do it. Why? Hey, you guys look really cool, but we have a Herod problem. We have this thing could blow and we could lose our lives because of this message you walked into the middle of our town with. Like, this is a significant thing. The people are afraid of what might happen. And so you immediately begin to see the conniving brilliance of, uh, this is not a guy who like, oh no, you know, the sky is falling, the Messiah is here. Herod goes into immediate action. Look at, look at the action he jumps into, verse 4-7. through seven. It says, And assembling all the chief priests and the scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. And they told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet, And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judea, are by no means the least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. What you need to know is Herod goes on an immediate fact-finding mission. Even though he says, you know, the Messiah, all he wants to know is where was he born and when. You know, I want to know where and when so I can go kill this child. This is what he knows. It is a lot easier to kill a little child, a toddler, than it is a grown Messiah. Amen? 
He, he really understands that I have a window of opportunity to wipe out this threat and I need to jump on it. So he calls all of his, his, you know, the chief priests and the scribes and everybody who should know and he gathers up and he gets his information as quick as he can. I was laughing about this because I literally was thinking it just felt like a nursery rhyme to me. I know, I'm weird, but I was like thinking, you know, and all the king's horses and all the king's men were brought in. So I literally started writing a nursery rhyme. <laughs> Are you ready for this? <laughs> my wife just left on a college trip with my son. I'm so glad she's not here because <laughs> hey, we get in trouble. Here it comes. Old King Herod, he was a bit scared from the message the Magi had brought. So he called for the priests and he called for the scribes to learn where the Christ was begot. That's it. That's all I had. But I was like, <laughs> I don't think anybody's going to publish it, but I was like, yeah, that's exactly what happened. He's, he is immediately needing to ascertain where Christ was born. Now, I said, it shocks me that he so flippantly says, tell me where Messiah will be born. He knows who this is supposed to be. And he even has on his doorstep kingmakers. What an opportunity for repentance. What do you think? When at the end of your long reign, the real king shows up, but he doesn't go that route. He knows who it's supposed to be. And, and then you have the chief priests and the scribes and I got to tell you this is so sad to me and I don't want you to miss this point he asked them tell me where the child's going to be born do they stutter do they know exactly where he is in Bethlehem of Judea for so it's written by the prophet Isaac and you O Bethlehem in the land of Judea one will come forth a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel friends they know exactly who he is and where he's from, and when, and how, and everything. And guess what? They don't care. I'm telling you, you can almost see Bethlehem from parts of Jerusalem. In this day and age, it is a very short car ride to get there. Now, if you are a chief priest and a scribe, and whatever amount of months left, suddenly the priestly shepherding squad, the shepherds who work for you, talk about an event where the sky split open and angels proclaimed the birth of Messiah and the news hit Bethlehem and it went out into the fields and the countryside and everybody's wondering, you'd think you'd get on your donkey and go down the road to find out. Now, here's why I want you to understand. In this room, including the pastor, can tell you everything about Jesus. Not everything. I can tell you who He is. I can tell you why He's here. I can tell you why He came. I can tell you His purpose. I can tell you why the church exists. I can tell you all those things. The question is, have I done anything about going to worship Him? Churches are in danger of being full of people who are just like these scribes. And what I want you to understand is in that moment, they did not care. Listen to this. They would rather bargain and manipulate with a loser like Herod for a little bit of power and authority according to their plan than to go find the King of Kings and worship Him and bow down to whatever His plan is. So where are you? Did you come this morning to learn more about Him? Or did you come to worship Him? Beware thinking that because you have facts and figures and knowledge that that somehow puts you in the right frame to receive the King of Kings. The question is, are you ready to worship Him? And suddenly you have everybody in the room who should have worshipped Him and none of them even cared or had gone to. And you got a bunch of Gentiles who aren't even part of the covenant promise of God who's left everything, traveled all this way with one thought in mind. If He's who He says He was and God has sent Him, then we will worship Him. 
It's just a good moment for us to think, right? This last part is quite profound. In verse 8, you see this false front. Um, I almost feel like saying, and the Oscar goes to Herod. Because in this verse it says, he sent them to Bethlehem saying, go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. I've got to tell you guys, the more I've studied this moment, this guy was a political lion. In this moment, he cannot risk offending the Magi. He cannot appear threatened in his kingdom. He also cannot let the Jews believe that somehow he is acknowledging their testimony. The whole place is in an uproar. And if he overreacts, then he's not the genuine king. But if he underreacts, he's offending the Persian army. And who knows? They could have a riot in the middle of all this. So what does he do? He brings them in secretly. And you can almost just see him. I'm so humbled that you're here. What you've said is amazing. I mean, if this is the Messiah, I mean, aren't we all waiting for a great king? Would you do this for me? Would you go? I mean, you can see how this has stirred up the community. I mean, we need to know, is it really Him? Would you go? And if you find Him, would you come tell me so I can worship Him? I don't think they're going to give me an Oscar. I thought that was pretty good. <laughs> Seriously, did you feel it? The politician, the, I mean, he literally... Twist the whole thing, but because it says that the Magi left and they had no idea of what Herod was planning. Friends, royal opposition. Herod is working to kill this child. But now I want you to see what I think is most important. It's at the center of this passage, royal worship. Royal worship. Verses 9 and 11 say this. After listening to the king... They went on their way, and behold, the star that they had seen when it rose before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy, and going into the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. Now, I just want to tell you guys this. Royal worship, I could have said real worship. And I want you to understand, there is a lot of pseudo-limited worship that goes on. How many of you know that we'll worship something given enough time? We, we have a heart that if it's not filled with Christ, we'll fill it with anything. Here's the problem. All worship, excluding royal worship, is empty. All worship, excluding royal worship, is empty. You can give your life to anything. You can set anything up on a pedestal. Sometimes we put our kids up there. We put a relationship up there. We put all the typical things that are so easy. We put power, influence, security, and we put it up there. The problem is none of them are worth the journey of your life, are they? But everything changes when you encounter the one we were created to worship. How many of you know you were made by God to cheer? Do you know that? You were made to respond to the living God for who He was. And you will never have joy. I'm telling you, person, take this to the bank. You will never find joy until you find yourself worshiping Jesus Christ. Because that is what you were made to do. And what is so good about this is I want you to see how this unfolds. Literally, suddenly, after who knows, a year-long journey, these men have their heading. They know where he is. In Bethlehem. And then can you imagine, they're like, Bethlehem of Judea, what province is that in? They're like, it's four miles that way. Good to talk to you, Herod. 
Literally, can you imagine? They go out, they're packed. I mean, it does, you don't pack up 300 people like that. I mean, they're strapping things to camels and donkeys, and, and the soldiers are getting all their gear together, and everybody in town's going, man, they were just here for a little bit. Look at them, they're leaving. What's going on? And they're getting together, and there's this energy, probably an energy they haven't had in over a year. Okay, it's just building. Do you know where we're going? We're going to Bethlehem. It's just right down. That's where they said it is. We're going to Bethlehem. And all of a sudden, the gates of Jerusalem open. And all of a sudden, what you only saw from a great distance, a light bright enough for you to think that it was a star that lit up the night sky, and because your whole world is built on a relationship with God that exists in the sky, and it was the first time you have seen anything like it, it could only be reflected of the King of Kings. So by faith, you have been led to this moment. You have a location. You step outside. And all of the sudden, the Shekinah glory of God meets you. This is the first time you've seen it in a year. Only you're not far off. It's right there. It is literally shining down upon you. And the Bible says that at the moment they saw it, they lost their minds. You know what it says? This is so good. It says, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. In Greek, that's superlative, superlative, superlative joy. It is joy that they could not explain. But could you imagine in that moment because it was the ultimate validation point of everything they had hoped for. It's like, I, I knew you were real. I knew my whole life staring up at the heavens wasn't a waste of time, that there is a God, and now that God is giving me a personal escort to His Son. Literally, do you want to know another one of those moments I want to see when I get to heaven? I want to see the Magi escort to Bethlehem. Because there's nothing else like it in the Bible until you go back into the Old Testament and God led the people of Israel with a pillar of fire. The most tangible moment of there is a God and He is in charge and glory is leading you to glory. Did you know what your devotions are supposed to be like? Do you know what encountering the Word of God through the Word is supposed to be like? Whose Word is this? It's God. Who's He revealing? Jesus Christ. And His truth begins to unfold. And you begin to discover Him. And you realize that He has one trajectory, one location, one place. And His glory is the thing that is drawing us like a heat-seeking missile to the author of glory. To do what? To worship Him. Worship that explodes is reserved for when you discover the real thing. Amen? All friends, there is nothing like the glory of God. I love it because someday we're going to get to heaven. And some of you people who think you're going to be harping it out on a cloud, wrong. <laughs> you are going to be sitting there with your, you're going to have to keep picking your mouth up. We're going to have the strongest jaw muscles in eternity because we're always going to be like, <laughs> He did it again! He did it again. His glory was greater than we ever thought. Can you believe that? We've been here five billion years. We think we'd know him by now. What? It's God Almighty and his son Jesus Christ. I love it. These guys go crazy. They're worshiping. I know, I don't know exactly what it looked like. I just imagine Magi hanging off their camels, high-fiving soldiers. Yeah, baby! And they make their way. You, you just gotta be. Just imagine you're following him into this little hovel, and it says the light stops over the house. Does that sound like a star five billion miles up in the something of the glory of God? Just boom. there it is. And this is so good. It says you know they they went into the house. 
They go in. I love it. <laughs> there's a worship that explodes when you connect with the real thing, but there's a worship that exposes. Can I finish with this today? Do you notice that when they went into the house, they see Mary and uh, they see the baby or the, the child? And then it makes it very clear, but they fell down and they worshiped him. Who did they not worship? If you come from a background that has taken Mary and raised her up to some level of deity, then you have to deal with the fact that the Magi, the kingmakers, did not worship her. They did not give gifts to her. And she was a godly, you know, Old Testament saint, an incredible woman of virtue, but she was a human woman who had surrendered her life to God, and they were not there to worship her. Just again, understand that this story exposes that there is only one person worthy of your worship. Worship is a powerful word. It literally means to kiss the feet. I mean, can you imagine this scene? The most powerful men in Persia walk into your living room and fall down and begin to kiss the feet of your child. And if you were wondering who he might be, even pondering those things in your heart, how many of you think this one helped? I think Joseph was just standing outside going, this is so weird. There's soldiers all around him. I love it. But then, it says they give him their gifts. And we've all studied these different gifts, and we know what they are because we hear them every year. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Understand that gold is always the gift you give royalty. It's been that way forever. It's the most precious, and we would say, oh, platinum. Gold reflecting his worth, acknowledging the fact that this is the gift you give a king. And then frankincense is even as powerful because do you know what frankincense is? It's a type of perfume and spice, but do you know where they would store frankincense? It was at the, it was at the front of the temple. It was at the front of the temple because its, it's, it's purpose, literally in the, in the Jewish culture, was to appease deity. It was to be pleasing to God. And then the final gift is myrrh, and we know a little bit more about that because how many of you know that, that myrrh is used at death? It's almost an embalming perfume that they put on a body. So literally understand what was happening in that moment and the power of it. When they find the child, what they do is they fall down before him and they say, you are the king of kings. This is our worship, by the way. What do you and I do? when we come into the presence of God. Where do we start? Churches, this is where we start. I start by coming before Him, and I come before my Lord and my Savior Jesus Christ, and I acknowledge, you are Lord. You are the King. You are the Messiah God. You are God. And then what else do we do? We come in with frankincense, and we're not offering him this frankincense. We come with our life, and what we say is, I want to be pleasing to you. What do you think worship is? We come in, I just need something out of worship. No, you want to know what worship is? It's when you and I get down and you go, God, you who are Lord and died for me, I want to please you. You love me. So what's my heartfelt response? I want to be pleasing. I want my life to be a fragrant aroma. Don't you want Jesus to go, Duncan? <laughs> How about you? Put your name in. That's my kid. Oh, they're living today. I know they're not perfect, but my blood and my righteousness covers them. Man, I am well pleased with them. And then you know what we do? We come back to the moment that unlocks everything. And the myrrh is when we come to this moment, church, and we say, because you died for me. You are the King of kings. You are divine God. 
and I would be pleasing to you because you are the only one who has died on the cross for my sins. Friends, the center of worship when we do communion, why is the death of Jesus Christ? Because it is the thing that unlocks everything. It makes Him the King superlative. It makes Him beyond anyone else in this world. There have been kings and there have been kingdoms, but there has never been a Son of God, a royal king, who died and rose again. His name is Jesus Christ, and we should worship Him. And that's what they do. They kiss the feet of the Son of God. And if you would know joy, that is the position. We bow down and we lay our crown at the feet of Jesus. Amen, church? There's a lot in this story, isn't there? And Matthew tells it so that you and I would know this is the King of Kings. Let me pray for you. Father God, you are King and you are Lord. You are royalty. God, you are where worship makes sense. And I I pray today for those who came, maybe they weren't expecting to hear a Christmas sermon, but God, this is not just Christmas. This is everything. Lord, we want to be like wise men. God, we have no authority or royalty in ourselves, but God, we want to seek you. We want to find you. And you say if we do, that you will. And so God, I pray today that you would give us a new understanding of who our Savior is. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.